Go. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead. Lesson number four. The Walt Densian. So we're gonna look at them in just a minute. Before we do, we want to um, start Alice Trace from that beginning, that first church there that Christ established. We see the power of Pentecost, and then we're gonna look at it, uh, come through a little bit unto the Walt Densians. And so Ephesians 3, 21 there, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And so we know this, that if whatever Jesus started on earth, we'll see that thing continue, world without end. It's, it's, it's going to be Christ, he, even in, in the Great Commission, that he will be with you always. Amen. Even to the end of the world. And so whatever Christ established, that thing's going to go on and it's not going to end until he comes. Amen. And so that's what we see uh, in, in the scripture. So we ought to be able to see that, that, that pattern that was established. We ought to be able to see that uh, throughout the churches as they as they uh, start and then and then uh, continue on. And then look at the, our page here, page number 35. Again, just this introduction will help us to see the, uh, the aim of this particular uh, section that we're in. It says on page number 35, in this lesson, we will begin to trace the ba baptized believers through the church age. As we learn about the various Baptist groups and their faith, we will also learn something about the God of the Bible. Namely, that God has promised to preserve some things in His glory, and He has done just that. Well, uh, since we learn early on in the scripture that God promises to preserve Israel, we can clearly see today that He has kept His promise. We also learn in the Bible that God will preserve His word. We can also see that He has kept His promise uh, in this area as well. What many do not realize is that the same God that promised to preserve Israel in the Bible has also promised to preserve the local church. In the above scripture, we know that he will have a living testimony at all times in the church age. What God uh, preserved has all, what was always doctrinally pure and had no affiliation with the false Catholic institution. The groups we are about to study are his faithful remnant. For those who disagree, the challenge is put forward to produce other groups that more closely follow the New Testament pattern in these particular times in history. There are none. These are the groups who held the Baptist principles, and these are the groups that were slanderously called rebaptizers and a Baptist by the enemies of God. They were called this due to their rejection of the apostate baptism of the establishment state churches. In Matthew 16, 18, we learn that this faithful remnant not only believed right, but they acted right. They carried out the Great Commission fervently. They are pictured in Matthew 6, 8, 16, 18 as a group storming the gates of hell for souls. In June 23, these believers, like you and I, were to pull the lost out of the fire. This is a great identifying mark of true churches. They are extremely evangelistic. If ever there was a group that fit this description, both in sound doctrine and zealous practice, it would have to be our first group uh, of study, first group of study, the Waldensians. This amazing body of Baptist Christians is truly worthy of serious consideration. We're going to look at the Waldensians here in a minute, uh, and we'll see a couple other things. I, I want to bring a few things out uh, and, and a little bit extra just to show that we don't jump just from the apostles to the Waldensians, but it's very close to that, all right? But one might ask, what happened to the apostolic churches, right? Where did they go? We, but we can begin to follow those in the scripture, and that's what we want to do, amen? He calls this the period of, 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 of polemic. That's an interesting uh, word, and it actually means a controversial argument, meaning that this the period from really uh, Pauline time frame up into getting into the 100s or so. He says like 68 to 100. That's a very tough time because there's really not a whole lot beyond the Bible written about this time. We have a little bit from some from some Roman historians, uh, but uh, many see this as what was called the Age of Shadows just because what we find out about this time, you really have to infer a lot because you read some history and all that kind of infer. It's not long after that that it really begins to come become clear. So the Bible does give some insight. I'm trying to count a bunch in here on this. Uh, but that first scattering that took place there, the stoning of Stephen in Acts 7, and then we know in Acts 8, and they went everywhere uh, preaching the gospel. The 
apostles stayed back though in Jerusalem and uh, we would keep things going there. And then the gospel just from that point spread quickly. They had the command to go to teach, to go to teach, baptize, to teach, to observe all things. And that's what they began to do. So that first church there, that church in J Jerusalem, uh, that, that's our beginning church, right? What Jesus built, what he established, and we see that they brought forth uh, in, in that first church. I, I uh, sometimes at church we call it the First Baptist Church in Jerusalem. Amen. It's just for fun, amen. But I, I believe it. It's just fun yeah. to hear people's reactions when you say it, amen. Uh, then you have the scattering of the Jewish believers, like I mentioned there in Acts chapter 8. Uh, Samaria was soon reached. We see people begin to get saved there and baptized. We see the Ethiopian unity. And even head back to Ethiopia. And if you study history, Ethiopia was a place that many Christians came out of. So no doubt a church was established even down in Africa. We have a Saul and a, 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 a Ananias there. The Damascus that took place up there. There was already believers there, by the way. When Paul got there and saw, which is interesting, we see uh, the saints at Lydda and Joppa. It just, it just spread. Amen. Uh, the gospel then is received, of course, by the Gentiles, Acts 10. Uh, and and uh, Caesarea with Cornelius uh, by Acts 11 to 19. The saints have preached and saw conversions as far as the East and Cyprus and Antioch. Antioch is going to be very, very, very important uh, because that, of course, is where uh, Paul and Barnabas would get sent out of, and, uh, and then it would just explode from there, which we'll see. Acts 12 reports James being put to death. The attempt to kill Peter didn't work. Uh, no, uh, the angel had to come and wake him up and, and get, uh, get him out of jail, amen. And, and then we'll find, uh, even Peter talks about uh, being in, in Babylon. I believe that to be literal, not figurative, uh, because it talks about the church of Babylon. And then in Acts 13, you see the commissioning, Paul and Barnabas. Of course, they go into Galatia, Asia Minor, Macedonia, and Chia, And then ultimately that fourth run for Paul in, in Rome. And uh, so Paul would die in Rome around 68 BC. So this is going to be the, the beginning of the propagation of the churches, well recorded in the Word of God. So it's not just uh, that what took place there in Jerusalem. We get the advantage from the New Testament of seeing how churches now are starting, they're operating, and they are they're confirming about preaching the gospel. So we see the doctrine, how something's established, but then we see their practice and how this actually works out. And then, by the way, uh, it's once we, with, with Paul in Rome, we begin to see Roman persecution, the, the persecution of those early believers. And so uh, I just kind of brought this out to see a little bit, but if you notice, if you look way down here in Jerusalem, this is where that, that uh, first church would be established. And then, man, it wasn't long, you're only talking 30 some years. And now all of a sudden, and this doesn't even show which place out here in Ethiopia, and all these little dots all over the map, churches are starting. All, all over the map, even in Crete. Uh, Titus is sent to Crete to, to uh, something was already going on there, but it was it was not right doctrinally. And so Titus is sent there to ordain elders and to reestablish a, a, a proper way of doing things. And uh, he called them out a bunch of things, but he was ordaining elders and then setting up uh, bishops there to run those churches there in Crete. We know that, uh, that Paul ultimately would end up this last journey, of course, going through there, Arabs and the Rock and all that would come, and he would end up all the way up in here in Rome. So, all, but all along the way, all along the way, you're finding believers. And so, but, and, and, and when, you, when you look at even uh, Priscilla, Pula, and all that, they, they, they had access into Italy, the Rome area, and all that. So, the, the gospel is going everywhere. And it happened very, very, very quickly. Churches now are being established, and they're being established based on what they've been taught by the apostles. And first generation people being saved right after them as well. So what we see in that will tell us that this is how it should continue. How that's been established is how we should be today. If it's different, then we've somehow departed from what Jesus established. Amen? And so the Roman persecutions would go, this would just kind of show a time frame. It is believed that Nero would be the one that would ultimately have Paul put to death. And, uh, and then, of course, the Venetian trade and all these ten very well-known emperors. And it would take us all the way to the 300s. This Roman persecution of, of Christians, of people trying to establish local churches after the pattern 
of what Jesus Christ started, uh, and, and it was hated. We were, uh, our people were, were really hated for what was going on because of, of how people were being changed through the gospel. It wasn't just joining the club. It wasn't just uh, having a new religion. There are many religions that have worked right, us off, right alongside the room all these years, and they were just fine. Now, this religion that's based on Jesus Christ and the truth, man, people were being transformed, and it actually caused quite a stir, just like it still does to this day. Uh, this was the period of second generation Christians that we just kind of saw that we worked through there. And coldness and apostasy was creeping in to some of these churches, which would ultimately bring forth what we find with Constantine, him given the, uh, the, 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 the olive branch, if you will, to churches to uh, be able to hook up with the state and uh, be able to take what they had, mirror that with the state. Just think how strong we can be if, if, we, if we hook up. And, and that's exactly what Constantine did. But because of the apostasy, the willingness to depart from what Christ had given an establishment of local churches. I don't, I'm, I'm sure the same is true in your local church as in ours, is that there's a lot of things that are just not negotiable, amen? And it's, it's how our church operates based on scripture. We just we just can't throw that out. We, we can't depart from that. We, we, we have what the word of God has given, right? And if that's, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to see our church lose the candlestick. I, I, don't, I don't want to see the, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit not be invited into our local church and it's just man-made now. And that, that's, not, that's not on the table for us, amen? But for some it is. And for many, church to them is more about themselves than it is about the Lord. It's more about, about growing a crowd and having impact than it is on seeing lives uh, uh, delivered and then transformed. Uh, uh, for Christ, and so we just got to keep the main thing the main thing, and the only way we'll do that is if we let what Christ did in starting the churches, and what we see in our propagation of churches throughout the, the New Testament epistles, if we lose that pattern, then we've lost what Christ established, and while many have, we can't. Now, what this says is that it's in the midst of this apostasy that God does raise up a group of people who would ultimately be known as the Waldensians. Now, uh, Brother Alexander wrote this book because there's just not a lot out there on them. I will just say, if you're interested in this period of time, this book is not a long read. Not a lot of books do I read cover to cover all that. I'm more of a skimmer than I am a reader. But I've read this book. Amen. It's a really good book. But he really discusses and brings out a lot of source material and things that you really won't get elsewhere. But it's great, but we'll reference that here in just a minute. About the Waldensians, true Baptist churches dating as early as 120 AD, the beginnings of the Waldenses. And so this, this group is what we can follow and see. And they'll go all the way up into the 1500s. There'll be other groups along the way, but this group is a huge bridge to the, the connection, if you will, to, uh, to the churches in that first generation. Their antiquity is proven, meaning the, the facts of their, of their history. It's a proven fact. And uh, which you can you can see Hebrews 13:24, the book of Hebrews was was completed by AD 95. We find in that book uh, listing out uh, some things there that uh, that were identified with Waldenses. In a sense, it definitely could could strongly be a strong testimony of the baptized believers well established in Italy by them. By the time Paul got there, he was preaching truth. Way up in Rome, we're seeing. What Paul is doing there, of course believers then were, were born and churches were born out of that. The evidence of the church at Rome, Italy, possibly dates back to the convert, converts of Peter on the day of Pentecost. Remember, because people all traveled in for that day of Pentecost and all languages and nations and all that were represented in the kingdom and then they would go back to their respective places. And so a lot of places that Paul went, the gospel had already got to uh, I believe Italy, Rome was one of those. Paul was also there during, during that uh, that fourth missionary journey, yes, right. and so again, just showing that that place definitely had the gospel. Italy had the gospel preached to it. The enemies of the Baptists uh, fight against their antiquity. 
So some of the strongest voices against some of the early dates of the Waldensians uh, are the fundamentalists that promote uh, a modern version. So you'll find that if you have a right church, you also have a right Bible. All right. If, if doctrine and the word is how we know how a church is established, of course the enemy wants to replace our Bible because then it will change our doctrine. And if, if the enemy can change our doctrine, then what we have as a church will not reflect what Jesus Christ established as our right. church. So if we're the pillar and crown of the truth, then we ought to have the right Bible. Amen? Amen. Well, the Waldensian's Bible is very interesting in your book. We'll talk about that. And there's some things in here that actually talk about that more. But the, the Italic Bible, that's a that's an interesting. So have you ever heard that there was more than one Latin Vulcan? Right? There was an earlier Latin version. And then there was the later one that Jerome did. Jerome's was based on a corrupt text, uh, whereas the earlier was not. There were two lines of thought. If we, I'll look back here real quick. We'll, let's just uh, show that map again. The, uh, this Antioch here, where it would be first generation Christianity outside of Jerusalem, they're, they're, the word of God was here, and it's, it's known that there is a, 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 a manuscript true manuscript that originated here. And then there's another down here in Alexandria in Egypt, where you have Alexandrius, you have Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, and the, 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 all the people down here that were translating and all that, trying to propagate scriptures, they were more of a philosophical type, they, the origin of these different ones that you might know. This is this is more of, of a place of apostasy. Egypt has always been known as that, but Alexandria, a place of apostasy. No that when God set forth and seen, and, and all these churches were established, no death went this way, amen, up into Italy. And they took this, this Bible with them. And so the scriptures they had came out of Antioch. And so, of course, if Rome then, the, if, if Italy, if the believers came from what was established from Antioch through Paul, then what we should find is correct scriptures. Well, you can look up and you can do some study on the Italian Bible, which would be the Vetus Latina, or what was called the Old Italian Bible. This is what the Waldenses would use, and it would go all the way back into the 300s AD. And so very interesting that, 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 that that's the case. And it's believed that the Waldenses were actually the ones that, that translated and brought forth that particular Bible. If you study the Waldenses, you're going to find these were people of the book. They were hated, they were persecuted, and it was hard to, to carry Bible with them. What they would do is they would actually have families that were committed to certain parts of the Bible. It would be like uh, the Hitler family is going to have the book of Romans. And it's, it's on you to memorize it and be able to reproduce it. So if, if, if the Romans came in and burnt all the scriptures, all the parchments, if, if they burnt all the copies, as soon as that happened, the Hitler's got to hide out and they have to repen the book of Romans, right? And so all these families in the Waldenses that were grouped together, they were given different parts of the Bible, and that's exactly what they would do. And they were they were known to hide out in the Swiss Alps, and they would come down, and they would they were they would evangelize, and then as they would be persecuted, they'd run back up into the Alps, and they would hide out, and they would train, and they they, they had what, what uh, they 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 called uh, their little schools, and their schools all they did was teach Bible. They weren't teaching anything else. They taught. Bible, amen. All right. and, uh, so, and they, they did it, and they knew their preachers knew the life expectancy of, of a Waldensis preacher was three years. And then they would go out, they would preach, they would establish works, and then they would get killed. And that's how they operated for centuries, centuries, and their history. Matter of fact, there's a place on uh, the, the Valdez in North Carolina. You can go there. Uh, it's a, it's a Waldensian's walk of faith is what it's called. If you go down Highway 77 and go south uh, out of, out of uh, Virginia, you'll hit it. And uh, you go down there and it's, it's Waldensian descendants. There's actually two 
uh, uh, groups of well, in our in our in the United States of America that live here. One in North Carolina, I think the other one's up in Wisconsin, I think it is. And uh, you can go, you can learn. They, they teach their family history. And if you ever get a chance to go through there, it, man, you'll, you'll weep because you'll go through and you'll, you'll, they'll show you uh, videos where they've gone over and compiled history and brought a bunch of stuff back and they've built things here that, that kind of show what their people went through. But they, they know their history and they know how far back it goes. Uh, but the Word of God, you can trace back that far. The, the Elimitan Bible as well. This would be a French translation. It would be dated much later. It would be dated into the 1500s. Uh, but this was the first French translation of which is believed to be the Geneva Bible. But the one who translated it is well known. It was a Waldensian named uh, Pierre Robert Alibitin. And so that was Waldensian. So from, from the very early ages, they were people of the book. And all the way up into the 1500s, the Waldensians were people of the book. Now, if you read a lot of Waldensians, you'll find that the reformers tried to claim them and say that reformed theology came from them. That's just wrong. They try to say that they were they were more Protestant. They weren't. They were before the Reformation, well before. And so anyway, there's a lot of people that try to hijack. I think even uh, 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 who is it? Uh, uh, Ellen White is uh, I'm trying to think of her first letter, whatever. The uh, Seventh Day Adventist. They try to say that the Waldensians were Sabbath day worship, uh, worshipers. They weren't. Uh, but you can go back. But they, everybody tries to claim them for something. Uh, but when you really study Waldensian history, they were people of the book. They evangelized it, and they, they did have Baptist uh, a doctrine for their theology. But just know that before the Bible was as it is today, we have a great opportunity today. We have a full, completed scripture. We can go back, we have time, we can study, we have all kinds of tools. And imagine if you're running through your life for your life all the time, trying to keep your family from being slaughtered, and you're trying to do right by the Word of God, and uh, uh, just trying to get people saved, preserve the book, uh, it would be a different lifestyle. So, Amen. Do, do they differ a little bit on some things? Yeah, you'll find a lot of these groups do a little bit, uh, but uh, they don't have time to critique everything like we do. Uh, they, were, they were just trying to do what they could while they could, because their life was going to be short. Amen. So, uh, the wall didn't seem to end their Bibles. So, Many sources prove their antiquity. These, some of these sources are mentioned actually in the book. If you want to read through the pages there, page 38. Uh, this uh, first guy was a former Waldensian preacher. Former because he actually left the Waldenses and, and joined up with Catholicism. And he became an inquisitor. An inquisitor is one who would hunt down these people and then put them on trial because of what they believed against the Catholic Church. And so he stated this about the Waldensians. He said, some say that it is the Waldensian schism, and it dates back to the time of Sylvester, which was 325, others to the time of the apostles. This was a, a, a Roman inquisitor who studied with them. He said in that day, in the 300s uh, time frame, he was saying it was well known that they dated back to potentially the time of the apostles. Uh, David of Augsburg said they call themselves successors of the apostles and say that they are in possession of the apostolic authority and of the keys to bind and unbind. Can I say, I would say the same thing. Amen. I believe that we that preach truth today that are, are born again sure. by the blood of Jesus and our churches actually go back to apostolic uh, uh, a, an apostolic authority. Amen? If we Amen. don't, then we are not in that line. But we should be. Amen? Right. That was Christ's intent. So, interesting that they claimed to be in that line like we were. The great church historian Neander said this, the Waldenses of this period asserted the high antiquity of their sect. He then explained that they believed that they existed well before Constantine and the existence of the Roman Catholic institution. Amen? And so, of course, Catholicism would go back to Constantine and that first marriage of state and religion. We assert that the true churches of that day did not join in with that monster, but stayed separate. Right. That's the line that we would trace ourselves back through, not through the line of Catholicism. That's why when I said earlier, 
Uh, some would say Baptists come through Protestantism. Well, Protestantism definitely comes through Catholicism because they protest that with, with Luther and the Catholic Wittenberg and 95 Thesis. But then we claim we didn't come through any of that, that we actually have a line that goes directly back to what Jesus Christ has done yes. uh, in the Word of God. So we're not Protestant. We're not, we're not protesting anything. We're just preaching. Amen. We're not protesters. We're preachers. And amen. We, we declare truth. Amen. And we're not trying to, like Luther did, he was trying to rescue uh, what Catholicism began with. We're not trying to rescue anything concerning Catholicism. We're just preaching against it. Amen. And so, amen. anyway, interesting to see some, some of these people said. Theodore Beeson, a 16th century reformer, reformer, of course, going, going to connect with what took place there with, with, uh, with Luther and uh, with uh, Martin Luther and others, the, the reformers. He says, as for the Waldenses, I may be permitted to call them the very seed of the primitive and pure Christian church. And so again, just listen to some of these people, what they're saying, and uh, they're saying, man, they go way back. They go way back, like unto what Jesus Christ did. Amen. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, one time president of Princeton University, said one of the popish writers speaking of the Waldensians says the heresy of the Waldensians is the oldest heresy in the world. And he said that, uh, uh, well, ultimately the author would say, but even, even Jonathan Edwards would say that that was a compliment. Amen. That the Waldensians is that heresy because it was the heresy that Romanism persecuted and if it's a if it's a heresy to Romanism then that's a good thing because Romanism was a heresy and uh, they saw it as a threat to their heresy so they persecuted for those that believe like the Waldenses and can I say if you and I were alive that day we would have been persecuted too but, uh, they resided in the valleys of the Alps in France and Italy. So that's where they got their name, the Vidoy, and it would have to do with that region there, with Italy, and even under France. That's why when we follow a lot of these groups, this is going to be kind of that, that vein that we follow these groups through. will be from Italy and into France and uh, uh, in England and such. This will be, this will be the, the, the track that the, the true churches will take coming even unto America. So that's kind of that, that direction that we'll see. That's not to say that South never got the gospel, they did. Uh, but we follow the, the unbroken lineage of true churches. The, the line we can use is easiest, uh, most easily follow will be that line that takes this trek. It's not to say there weren't other churches. I'm sure there were, uh, especially what took place in Ethiopia and things like that. We're just using this to show that there is an unbroken line that we connect with here in our country. And so the name comes from the Italian word Valdisi, or the French word Vudal, meaning valley. And so these would be people of the valley, the Waldenses. Uh, some people try to connect uh, the Waldenses with Waldo, Peter Waldo. That would be much later. Uh, there is an attempt to connect, but that's not the true uh, meaning of that word or when they came from. Obviously, Peter Waldo was much later than the first Waldenses. The historian Boyer said, no people of modern times exhibit so much uh, analogy to the ancient Jewish people as the Godoy of, of the Alps of Piedmont. No history has more abounded in marvels than theirs. No church in parts. Uh, it's, it's really horrible. I think it's stated that over 20, it's, it's believed that over 25 million uh, Waldenses were killed. That's a hard number to swallow. Uh, millions and millions. I don't know if you've ever seen this, uh, this, uh, this uh, symbolic wall chart of the uh, Waldenses, but it's, it is very interesting. It does some, have some of that in your book. I'm actually going to look to this other book, the Waldenses, to kind of read about this particular chart. There's a lot here, a lot of symbology. A lot of things that the Waldensians did, they did it in symbology because they were always on the run. And so their own people would understand it, people that were taught under, under their uh, instruction, but then the Romans and all those that were against them would not understand it. 
But this particular thing actually showed some things about the Wallenses in antiquity that to just to point out. And it's these some of these things are difficult, like where does all this come from? Well, uh, just from history, this uh, chart through the lineage of Waldenses, this is just a, something that they put forth to testify of, of, of their lineage, if you will. And so I'm just going to read a couple things about uh, from this book about this, this chart. Ancient signs and symbols. It says, notice the manner uh, flowing above the angelic uh, uh, beings. The Waldenses uh, want the observer to know that they are about to present their history through the use of a series of symbols. So again, just noting here this banner and the angels, that they do believe that as a people group that God was with them, that God uh, uh, preserved them, that, that God is the one uh, through his angels that enabled them to do what they did. They take the credit of their own on this. Obviously, if you're being hunted down for centuries and you're still around, then, uh, then there's something going on there what they did, they pointed back to God for that. They say this next little thing here is actually talking about the light shining in darkness. And the darkness of that day and the light that they had that shined in. And uh, their take on that was, was that uh, the light shining in darkness. These are the words below the candlestick. This is the most noteworthy symbol as it has always uh, uh, widely See, it has always been widely used and is still commonly used today amongst the Waldensians. They're just a little candlestick, but they're shining in darkness. It says, this symbol tells the tale of the dark ages. The candle is, the, is enshrined in darkness. This, this speaks of the cruelty and bloodshed they experience at the hands of Rome. The light, however, shines up and out of darkness. This is, of course, speaks of their evangelistic effort during those dark days. Notice also the seven stars that surround this symbol. These seven stars represent the seven churches of Revelation and speak of the apostolic origin of the Buddha. And so what they're saying is, is that what, what God started uh, went through Christ and then we see depicted in, in, in the seven churches there of Asia Minor spelled out in the book of Revelation that they draw a connection to. And so they're showing that in this chart that they would connect themselves with those seven churches. The, the next thing is the, uh, the bush burning but not being consumed that he's holding up here, uh, the burning bush. He says, these words on the banner directly above the round symbol being held over by the Waldensi man on the left. This bush is on fire, but, but uh, being, uh, not being consumed. This is far more than a subtle reference to the call of Moses as recorded in the Bible. It speaks of the Waldensian churches and peoples that have been repeatedly burned. The Romanists are known to have beheaded not only Waldenses, but also Paulicians and Albigenses. Uh, sometimes whole villages found their fate to be thus. The Catholics would cart the, head, uh, the heads up on the mountains of the Roman churches, uh, Romanist churches, then would impale their heads on large pointed wooden poles and cover them with pitch. Raiders would pass by with torches and set the heads on flames. So what they would do is they would uh, the, the, the roads that would lead up to these 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 uh, uh, Roman, Roman areas that they would find Valencians in that were getting out. They would then take these robes that would head back to the Roman areas. They would either take whole bodies and impale them on sticks or cut off their heads and just take their heads up on a stick. They dip them in pitch or oil. They'd light them on fire. And it is said that they would literally use them as lampposts that would light the roads with the bodies and heads of Waldensians that were slaughtered throughout that time. It was a way to get rid of them. It was a way to use them. It was a way to warn other people not to go against Rome. That your, your end would be very similar. So he's just saying here that our, our lineage, our history is, is riddled with fire. They would burn our towns. They would burn our people. Uh, but even through that, we were burned, but we were not consumed. It's pretty powerful. Why? 
so so awesome thing to consider, amen. And then we have the struggle and the, the, the freeing of oneself, which we see depicted here uh, in, in this particular thing as well. It says this, these are the words above the symbol on the, on the opposite right side of the chart. It depicts the lily of the Waldipsian valley. Forever this flower is wrapped up and entwined with the thorns and vines. It speaks of the trouble of the Yudav faced throughout, uh, throughout the church age. The struggle for liberty of conscience may be traced from the very beginning of Baptist church history. John the Baptist had his head cut off. Christ and his disciples all saw tortures and death at the hands of the enemy, enemies of the gospel. The imperial persecutions of Rome spanned over two centuries. Then Constantine was used to birth the villainous Roman Catholic Church. The monster flung open the doorway to the dark ages and become drunken with the blood of the saints yeah. and of the martyrs of Jesus. The Waldensians being the successors of the apostles saw many centuries of oppression and pain. This symbol tells the story of the struggle. It reminds the observer that the Vidal simply desired to be free free to have their own public assemblies, free to share their faith and distribute the bread of life, free to sing and preach and pray in the open air without fear of being uh, molested. This symbol should cause the, the, the possessors of such freedom today to stand in reverence of those who sought this freedom yes. and want the freedom that today's generations take for granted. When you go down and you walk through the Waldensies Walk of Faith, You'll walk through the history and you'll see the progression of how all this transpired. And then some of the battles that they began to won. The Waldensi struggle would actually lead uh, to the place that they they began to uh, they began to fight back. They actually did, and they 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 uh, they ended up getting themselves making sawmills and working in iron and making weaponry. And they did, they fought back against the Romans and they would win and they would win some freedom. But ironically, after they won their freedom leading up into that, uh, into that 1500 time frame, that's when they became apostate. Yeah. As long as they were being persecuted and as long as they were just sticking to what Christ established, they were, they, they were pure. And as soon as they got freedom and got that taste of growing and all that, they began to add to what Christ did, and they became apostate. And so the Waldensians today, when you go down and you talk, they are, they, they no longer have the right Bible, they've left off on right doctrine in some areas, and it's really sad. But for years, for centuries, they stuck with this gun, and they struggled, and they would all ultimately find freedom. But I would say they had freedom, even though that they were being persecuted. Not only this part, uh, well, this is the next. That the general history of the evangelistic churches in the Valley of Piedmont, the, 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 the Valley, is just saying, hey, this is us, this is our history. And then next at the bottom, if you look closely at that, it's actually picturing inquisitors in this. And uh, he's actually stepping here on a rosary and a crown and uh, just trampling the, the uh, artifacts and relics of Catholicism. And uh, let me just read this about it. It says, the large, uh, uh, man, uh, the banner was of the Buddha, but then uh, on the bottom of the scene uh, is a scene of hope and faith. This scene was a scene <coughs> that could only be realized by faith in the Bible. The Bible foretold the Buddha of the impending doom of the Romanists. The Buddha did not hate their persecutors. They hated the false religion that propagated a religion that led men into utter darkness and ultimately to hell. The Waldenses prayed for the day to hasten when God would make all things new. The, they, longed for, they longed for the day when the mother of harlots would have to face the Waldenses' righteous uh, heavenly father. They knew there would finally come a day when the devil, the beast, and his false prophet would all be cast in the lake of fire, Amen. and tormented day and night forever. And the last in heaven, the Buddha will finally be free. But it just shows that struggle of what they went through and that faith that one day it would be realized. Yes. So again, the, the Waldenses, they they don't they really don't have in, in history a proper place. But you and I, if we study them, you'll see how important 
they are. Look over at Hebrews 13. This is a really important text to read. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 13. Amazing how the scripture speaks of this time frame, especially the time frame leading uh, from, from uh, really hundred, the hundred area, even the time of the apostles. Uh, they, they were all pretty for the most part died torturous deaths and, and they were martyrs. And that blood would flow all the way through the dark ages. Can I say, even to this day, there are there are saints that are being slaughtered for their belief. Yeah. Houses being burned, families being destroyed and tortured, and pastors being being mocked and ridiculed and beheaded and, and uh, slanderously dealt with. But the Bible spoke of this in our text here in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith. It says in verse number 35, women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might attain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, uh, tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. I love this. Of, the, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves uh, of the earth. It says, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, but it says, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not, uh, should not be made perfect. They may, may have not received all that we see today, and even we have not received all that will come. But one day we have this belief that Jesus Christ will come and He will rule and reign. He will establish righteousness. And all these, all these things that have happened will be made right. God will make all things new through Christ. Yeah. So we find this throughout the ages. These are just marks that will find. Marks that will find throughout the ages of how the world treats the truth. Uh, how, how, did, how, did the early, how was the early church treated? They were ultimately persecuted. They were hunted down. They had the truth. They kept that. They didn't, they didn't bow. They stayed true. Amen. And uh, we should see that. Amen. As we see this throughout. This just shows some of the, some of the uh, horrible things they did. And uh, just pictured really in one chart. Stretching off on the wheel. They were, they were uh, rolled out bills as we saw last week. They were impaled with spiked cords. They, they were pulled asunder. They were sawn asunder as well. It was just a, total, a horrible time. The book uh, speaks more to that. And their, do their doctrine was strikingly Baptist on all major points. And we would connect with them, amen, as in, in our Baptist heritage. The Italian Bible, the Italian Bible they used, was used from AD 150. It's used as we saw for over a thousand years. Uh, and it was handed down. You get part of that received text. When you read about the King James translators using uh, the, the, uh, the, the ball gate, the ball gate they used was this ball gate, not the ball gate that was connected with Egypt. And then, of course, the Altan Bible, which ultimately would be what was used to bring forth the Geneva Bible. Which was, which was mightily used in the translation of our King James Bible. So their character. Generally, they were honest, God-fearing, and hard-working. And uh, I'm wanting just a couple last things here. You'll see this, how they actually work. Uh, they memorized a lot of Scripture. Uh, of course, can you guess why? Yeah, because they were being hunted and their Bibles were being burned. And then they had to... William Cathcart stated this, while Dempsey's loved the scriptures, could repeat entire books with ease, sometimes the whole New Testament. Amen? The whole New Testament. That's amazing. Amen? They were, they were extremely careful in their producing of Bibles. They, they, would, they would memorize it. They would keep reproducing it. They would pen this thing down. And that's what they did with the Waldenses. And that was a great service for God and for us today. One thing that they're known for was the Waldensian peddler, which like it, I think is, is like unto the handyman of our day. What do you find a lot of uh, Baptists today, instead of potentially working for a company and all that, sometimes they do. But one thing Baptists you'll find, I'm finding more and more, is they're handy. 
Sure. And they're they're able to go into houses and fix things and keep things moving. Well, that was the that was the Waldensian uh, Waldensian peddler, and he would go. They would go into towns as the handyman, and while they're working on people's houses, they find out that if the people were open to truth, and they would just preach the gospel there. That's how they're. That's how they propagated. And were very successful in propagating the gospel in a day that that, that they were hunted. And I, I think that's pretty interesting. The Waldensian peddler, uh, maybe uh, some of us be known as Baptist peddlers. I don't know. Uh, in our day, where we just we just go into houses and fix things, and we we find friends and people, and then of course as we as we uh, gain a connection with people, what do we do? We share our faith. Amen. Amen. Right. We tell them about Jesus. That's what we do, isn't it? Yes. He says the same thing, David. You see, that, the connections well evident when you study the life of the lives of the world. Let's just go ahead and review then, and we'll be done with this section. There's so much more to know about the world MCs. Uh, this book's available online, it's 15 bucks. I, I, I really believe it's what's that called? Uh, the Wal it says uh, the world MCs. It's just called the Waldensians, Scenes. It's by Ted Alexander. And it says here, of whom the world was not worthy. Uh, but it, it, Ted Alexander wrote this book. And it's, it, I, I think it's the best book he's ever written. But it's it's just a beautiful, uh, easy read concerning uh, uh, people that are, are really forgotten. And uh, from that book, you can do some more, some, some further study as well. But it's a good book. Uh, the review questions. Page number 44. God promised to preserve Israel. The Word of God and the local church. The local church, absolutely. Let us not forget that. Let's not be ashamed of that. Amen. Right. And uh, let's just realize if if God is is a man of His word, He is. Then, then we're going to see that. We're going to see it through so many. And uh, number two, these ancient groups were called rebaptizers or anabaptists. Rebaptizers. Why did they rebaptize? Because that first thing wasn't baptism. Right. The the uh, well, Dempsey's would not call themselves rebaptizers. I don't call myself a rebaptizer. If I had someone that, that comes in the church and they were baptized and they were an infant, I'd say, well, you were never baptized. Right. So we don't rebaptize, we, we baptize. But the enemy would say we're rebaptizers. Right. Makes sense? That's, that's kind of where the Anabaptists came from. Now, by the way, if you look up Anabaptists, Anabaptists you follow them, you're going to find some weird things. But if you follow the true Anabaptists, down through the ages, you're going to find them in a bunch of other names. And uh, we're going to tell you some more groups along those lines. Number three, they were called uh, these names because they rejected the apostate baptism of the state church. Number four, the Waldenses of Italy and France are the successors to the apostles. Now, we know that through the New Testament, there were some others that were successors right. as well. Ultimately, they're a connection for us down into that first century uh, churches established directly from the apostles. The antiquity of the Waldenses, it's a proven fact. We've read some quotes, but there's so many more. It's proven. Number six, the fundamentalist fight against the antiquity of the Waldenses because it exposes the false. modern versions or false versions. Yeah, it sure does because if you can see that the Waldenses were around all the way back into that 100, 150 AD time frame, then you're going to find they had a Bible. What was it? It was the entire thing. Number seven, A History of the Baptist by John T. Christian, which I talked about last time, two volumes of Christian. He actually talks about the early dates for the Waldenses. So we would look to his history. He was a Baptist, and uh, his, his books are highly regarded uh, for their uh, just the the uh, veracity of the, the, the works there. Number eight, the Waldenses resided in the valleys of the Alps, France and Italy. So a lot of the groups we're going to study, we're going to see come through there. Number nine, sometimes the Waldenses lived in caves for months at a time, hiding from the Romans, the, 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 the Roman, Roman Catholic Church. They would literally, at the, at the mouth of the cave, set fires and smoke them out. When they would come out, they would just slaughter them. Horrible. Yeah, 25. It's believed that over 25 million Waldenses were martyred for their for their faith. What's that? Number nine. 
Uh, it was months. months. They, they would hide in caves for months at a time. <laughs> Eleven of Waldensi. By the way, there's a replica of a cave. One of the families of the Waldensis went back over, and they were able to find a cave with, because they were they would write on the walls, they would carve up. They found a cave uh, over in the Alps, and they actually came back. They recorded their mentions, took pictures, and everything of this. They came back and they produced a replica of that cave, which you can walk in and, and go into there in North Carolina in the Walk Bay. Number eleven, the Waldensis. Uh, text of scripture is uh, represented in history through the Italica Bible and the Al uh, the Alvatan Bible. Number 11, William Cathcart stated sometimes the Waldensians could repeat the entire New Testament. I don't think, brother, I don't think you can do that yet. Oh, no. You got a lot of scripture memorized. Not brother. really. Oh, that's, that's amazing. The evangelistic salesmen were called Waldensian headlers. And salesmen, because they would go in and peddle, they would peddle items, they would peddle services, they would go in and be useful other people, befriend them, and then they gain their trust and then witness to them. And I believe that's very similar to what some of us do even this day. And lastly, I'll leave you with this thought. This is what uh, some of the Roman inquisitors did. This is a, 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 a pictorial. I believe this is picture, pretty sure picture there in that wall of faith. They have a lot of pictures of things like this. Other than this on the from. And this torture was to hang him by his thumb and with a weight on his feet to get him to, to get him to recant. All they wanted these people to do was to reject Christ. That's it. Reject your doctrine of baptism. Reject your belief that salvation is alone in Jesus Christ. Walk away from it, and we'll let you go. Crazy. Wow. So this thing kept the church doing that too, right? What's that? That would kept the church doing it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah, they were really good about thinking of horrible ways to torture people, to try to get them to uh, deny Christ. You know, it's interesting that they would deny that. They, they do not do that. Yeah. They do not they look at it as a time frame that they're not proud of most of them. But yeah. They, they do know. not the Catholics do not deny any of these things. Yeah. Well not the, the Catholics say that they're changed, they've grown, they've gotten better. They say it was the time period. And that's how people dealt with it. Yeah. And if they go they have, that, that they have now come to the place. Where we, it's, it's basically like in America, where we are, quote unquote, a more Protestant nation than we are a Catholic nation. It can actually be more of a heathen nation than we are anything. And, uh, but the reality is the, the Catholic Church is, says, well, we're going to become friends and be ecumenical and embrace these other religions. And so they are a big pusher for ecumenicalism in America. Why? Because it gets you closer to them. Right. And if they get you closer to them, they get you farther from the truth. Right. Which is why we do not, when the, the people call me today and ask me, well, we've got a group that we want to help people. In the, in the area, in the, and I'm like, okay, so if the churches uh, need some help helping people. I said, well, I tell you what you do. I said, you send me your information. I'm not giving you mine because what we do is when somebody calls looking for help, we try to help them. If we can't help them, then we call people that agree with us because what I do not want to do is send them to you to where you send them to the Romanist or to the Methodist or to somebody who is not doctrinally right and they get involved with them. You say, but it's helping people on the head. I don't want them to go to hell. I don't want them to start at death, but I don't want them to go to hell either. But if these people give me their information, 
and I and it gets to the place where I can't find anybody else. Hey, listen, I'll, I'll look off saying there. There's a social organization over here. I will get to hold of them and help you get the stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm not I'm, I'm not against re helping people out. Is what I'm saying, but the whole idea of bringing churches together in that manner is to get ecumenism and Romanism pushes that stuff. And most of your Protestant churches have embraced them. And so there leaves us and a few other groups out there that, I, that, that uh, just want to embrace that stuff. And they say, we're the bad guy. And I'm like, maybe we are to you, but we're the ones preaching Christ. And why would I get somebody to somebody that's not going to get them Christ? It's this. So, but uh, thank you, Brother Kaiser. Thank you, class, for being here. Brother Paul throws us in a word of prayer. Mr. Dear Father, we come before you today.